Hello, dear podcasting community. We're here at the Farming Healthcare Symposium here in Vienna. And today I have with me uh, Lubna Buarfa, um, startup founder of the startup Okra, as well as EU expert for artificial intelligence and data. I have Alexander Herzog, um, Secretary General of Farmig, and Martin Brunninger, um, CEO of the Austrian Social Insurance. Thank you for coming. You are at the Farmig Healthcare Symposium, and you just did a magnificent speech before I heard. <laughs> and I just want to ask you, uh, basically, how will artificial intelligence change the healthcare industry? Uh, thank you for the interview and uh, also for the invitation here uh, to Vienna. Um, so uh, AI will reshape healthcare in different uh, dimensions. So the first big change that um, I see healthcare um, AI contributing to is the shift from one fit for all medicine to individualized medicine. So it allows us to use uh, those learning algorithms to predict beforehand what is the right treatment that is needed for a particular patient given his uh, demographics, given his DNA, given his uh, historical uh, uh, records. And, and I think that's for, for healthcare, that is the big change. This change will bring a lot of changes with it economical changes related to uh, the way we will pay for our drugs. It's not more paying for the pill, it is going to pay for the outcome. And uh, that is, uh, for me, very linked to the circular economy that we are discussing, not only in healthcare, but for all other economies, how we should re reduce waste of products. And this is waste for drugs that we are prescribing the wrong drug to the wrong patient. So we will ch we will, our healthcare system will change to uh, uh, prescribing treatments that would work. So there are two scenarios in my head. Looking for the future, the one that I really hope will happen is that we will empower our current ecosystem of healthcare that we have here in Europe, from healthcare providers, secondary care, regressors, with AI that we can move fast. We can move fast and we can provide those treatments faster. The other scenario, which I hope it will not happen, is that another consumer platform will come, like the Alibaba or the Amazon, and it will come and will provide all those services. So it will basically replace a, uh, the public health care as we know it here in Europe. So we can choose which one. Either we be fast in our adoption uh, across the ecosystem, either we wait for the next consumer platform. Okay, so what you just outlined, I think I can uh, give to you, Mr. Brunninger. Um, Two things. The first thing uh, she just said is the economic changes. Uh, do you expect those as well as uh, a CEO of the Austrian Social Insurance? And the second thing is um, if there is a private marketplace, like she just described, uh, it would be a huge impact on your organization. So, how do you see those things? Yeah, no, thanks very much for having me. I think those are very relevant questions. And um, for me, um, using AI or not is, uh, is, is beyond a question, I would say. It's almost asking 30 years ago, uh, how do we use the internet? Do we make any use of the internet? Uh, no one is going to ask these questions anymore these days. So that uh, obviously improved the way how we communicate, that uh, improved the way how we, um, we operate in general. And um, what AI will do um, for us, it will make things uh, clearer. It will help us to operationalize things in a more constructive way. Uh, it will also uh, teach us um, and help us how to use uh, medication and, um, and, for, and, and also in, in our particular case, um, also how uh, we measure outcomes. Uh, outcome measurement and connecting the dots from the data is something that's uh, beyond the capability of a single human or even of a community of humans that has to be uh, that has to come from machine learning. Uh, so there's, there's no question about it. Uh, for, for Austria and um, uh, for my behalf for the, for the social insurance, um, we have a very strong commitment, uh, at least from the previous government. Now we have an interim government, but the previous government, and I'm, I have no doubt that the next government will see it the same way, um, to really um, um, trigger uh, the use of AI and, uh, and, uh, and integrate it in the way how we, uh, we do healthcare. And if it leads to those economic <coughs> changes uh, Mrs. Buafra just uh, described, are you prepared for that? <laughs> I think we are actually. Um, we have uh, two great organizations. So the digitalization of, uh, of, uh, of our, in Austria is further than, uh, than you may think. Um, uh, and I may say that because I have uh, had a look at uh, various jurisdictions, in, especially in Europe, 
And we have introduced uh, great things. We have introduced electronic billing, uh, which is in the SVC. Um, we also have introduced the uh, uh, electronic uh, patient record uh, successfully. So this is only an opt-out model, but this is already uh, in our everyday, in our everyday operational uh, situation with, with, with doctors uh, um, in the field, but also in the hospitals. So there we have two fantastic tools. What we need to do is to connect the dots and really use those data uh, that we have in the social insurance and um, to help uh, uh, healthcare professionals, but also to help us to do a better, a better job. Yeah. So you just gave me the, the perfect word data. But before I, I come to, to asking you about uh, the data aspect, especially in your experience as a startup founder, I, I may I go on with Alexander Herzog. Uh, Mr. Herzog, um, <coughs> what role does AI already play in the pharma industry in Austria? Uh, yes, unfortunately not that much. Um, as, as my colleagues are mentioning before, AI will, will have a major impact in, in the future. It's For me, it's unimaginable that future developments of medicines, especially when when we go from from single payment for a pill um, then we go to 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 our to, to a kind of an outcome based uh, reimbursement system which we definitely have have to find a way where where we are going going there for us it's unimaginable that this, this will this pass will be the gun without ai um, ai in in austria is coming slowly but it's coming very steadily also in into the field of of research research and development and also in the in the field of production where it is already there we have a big company in, in, in Vienna that is treating with, with, uh, with, with the whole issue of, of plasma and, and plasma products, uh, which is one of, one, of, one of the major impacts that the Austrian pharmaceutical industry has on Europe, Europe wise. They're already, already using it for the whole um, distribution and for the whole uh, pro pro production set. So it has an impact, but it has not, not enough impact. The main reason why it doesn't have is also big because we, um, and I can not agree more what you have said, also see the danger that companies like Amazon and companies like, like eBay um, will provide the full data. We are in a situation that the public sector, they have a lot of data, they have not, not, not enough data. <coughs> that the private sector has also a kind of a data set, but also doesn't have enough data. And we have, have, have to find bridges between those, those two silos to really uh, give the system, the, the healthcare system, and especially the, 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 patient, the patients the, the utmost benefit. And the benefit means faster access to innovative medicines, and the benefit mean, means also faster access to affordable medicines. So, uh, speaking of data, I, I will go on with you. Mr. Herzog, uh, what are the big challenges in data usage? You just said uh, the public sector has a lot of data, but not enough. The private sector has not enough. So, what are the big challenges? Because as I see, uh, there are huge amounts of data, but not available. Why? Yes, I mean, the big <laughs> challenge is, is, first of all, it's, it's a mental challenge. So you have to have the public and the political acceptance of the people and of the politicians, of the, of, the, of the lawmaker, that there is a sharing of data between the public and the private sector. So this is a primary, this is a political issue. And this is in a country where data protection is treated as a, as a very high and, and relevant asset. Unlike uh, in UK or in the US or in Scandinavian countries, where, where the kind of the data protection, the data sharing is more common, and and but this will at the end of the day it will um, inhibit a society of Austria in being an also economically competitive society in a concert where we, we where Europe has to find a place between China and and the U United States. So I see it, I see it more mentally think than a real practical thing because in practice the, the data are here and if we don't manage to find this bridge between the public available data and the, and the, and the private available data then companies like Amazon, companies like eBay, they will come in and, and companies like, like Google and simply because of the search risk results they know exactly which kind of epidemic or pandemic will come in the next days or next next weeks. This is unimaginable what, what they can do already and I don't want to have Austrian European data and European predictive models in the hands of, an, of a Silicon Valley based company. I don't want to have that and we should work on that. So we're always in this topic, uh, public versus private. And still, now I ask you as a startup founder, you actually founded a private company, Okra, which works with uh, healthcare data and AI. Why did you do that? What are you actually doing? <laughs> 
Um, so um, I made a transition from being a, a scientist to an entrepreneur because I saw that uh, at Europe we can make great research. We have great universities. Uh, I studied in Delft and in a, uh, it was postdoc at Imperial College and, and I saw, but it stops there. There is no scale. If you see uh, the United States, for example, Silicon Valley is the opposite. There is not much innovation, but there is scale the big platforms. So that's the point when I decided I want to become an entrepreneur and look into healthcare. I worked with surgeons in my PhD and I can see the impact. That's something I love as an entrepreneur, but there is not much scale. The largest hospital in Europe, how much size would it be? Maybe 30,000 max, but uh, that's not scalable. But if you look to a pill, to a drug, so how much patients are taking that particular pill? If you look around, if you're in in an uh, urban area and look into how many people are there and how many people are taking pills. So if we build an AI engine, like a backend, an AI system that makes sure, drives the right pill to the pi right patient, look how much impact we can have on a larger population. So that's the entrepreneur in me. That's why I started Okra. And what we at Okra do, exactly that. Operationalizing the interaction between life sciences and other stakeholders like uh, payers, uh, like healthcare providers, like investigators for clinical trials, so that things are not lost in translation. So AI is empowering the infield teams to communicate the right message around how the drug works, what patients do we need for this particular drug, and for, for example, for reimbursement for discussion, we can use AI to predict how, what are the key aspects of study so we can demonstrate a drug, for, for example, for Germany or for Austria. So um, using AI to communicate better and to speed the collaboration, I think it's the crucial thing to do now so we can make the spring jump to personalized, uh, personalized medicine. If we don't solve the problem of communication and the trust, we will not be able to move to you know, data-driven medicine and individualized medicine. So that's why our software at Organized B2B empowering the infield teams like reps, like uh, MSLs um, and uh, uh, market success professionals in their messaging. Uh, they can forecast better and, and they can make the right actions with the external stakeholders. Coming back to the topic of before, challenges and data usage, <coughs> could you share something with us? What challenges did you encounter as a startup founder? Uh, <laughs> there, there are many, but uh, as, a, uh, as I think that for every entrepreneur, when you start something new, it is not easy. It is about change management, change in culture. Life sciences is one of the important industries and uh, with a lot of impact, but also very regula uh, regulated, uh, highly conservative. And uh, what uh, the way that really works for us is by co-creation, by putting the user always in the center, by not trying to come up with a solution that is uh, that no one is waiting for. So what we do is we sit with the teams where we build the AI product for and we build it together with them. We do that exercise again and again and again. Only with them we can uh, support them and, and build an AI system for them that is solving and empowering them. And as I said in my presentation today, we need always to build the autopilot with, with the pilot in the cockpit. So empowering that pilot <clears throat> with the information so they can do their job better. And I think for all IT teams in the different life science companies, when I'm presenting to CIOs or the IT uh, heads, I say, you know, it is about empowering the user. It is about being problem-led, not solution-led. And that's, I think, what we need, and we need to do it uh, at speed. Because as, as, as we know that where the danger is coming from, we need to do it uh, quickly. And uh, uh, private-public collaboration is key to tackle this. So empowering the user. In fact, you as uh, the Austrian social insurance have 8 million customers. <laughs> and that means you have a huge pile of data. I stick with my topic, challenges in data usage. <laughs> what? <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's true. But I have to say that a user, in my particular case, um, when it comes to AI and technology, I would say it's really the doctor and the hospitals, uh, because they are, they are the ones who deliver care. And we have to focus uh, definitely a little bit more on them. Uh, how to make it easier, how to use the instrument in a better way, uh, to make the best use of AI and data so they can augment <coughs> their um, 
their qualifications uh, and their services uh, for the benefit of the patients. I think that's that's very important, um, especially when it comes to the electronic patient record and to uh, to the billing systems and to um, also um, an augmented way to uh, to do better diagnose, diagnosis. Um, that's that's uh, very important. And uh, as you say, yes, data are there, but it's the same thing. Also, asking the right questions and doing the right things with them. Uh, we have um, lots of data. Um, I think in, in your uh, in your area, we have um, we can sequence our, our, our genome within 24 hours nowadays uh, for $800. The data are there, but uh, we have to ask still the questions: what to do with them and how to connect the dots. Uh, and that's the key questions um, uh, that we have we have to solve. Uh, what I have to say also is yes, we have uh, from the social insurance part, we have probably um, the biggest common denominator in terms of what data we have, but there are still um, missing links and there are still data silos that uh, lack a bit of uh, a complete picture and a complete picture is important to do the useful thing with data. Now I want to go to, to another topic we just uh, talked about, we just discussed, uh, which is entrepreneurship. because. Uh, you also have a quite interesting background, uh, having worked in uh, fundamental research in health economy as well as an investment banker. So, um, what do you think? What does it need to bring, as uh, Ms. Buarfa did it, uh, science into business? Yeah. I mean, it sounds all very, um, very different, but in fact, if you look at it in detail, it's, it's actually not so different. Uh, basic science, uh, you have to do what you have to do, you have to ask the right questions, uh, then you have to structure the way how to get to an answer, the impossible answer, you plan your experiment, and then you basically add it to the community of uh, all the other results that are out in research. Um, what it taught me also is the sheer complexity uh, of, um, of physiology and molecular biology, understanding that it, how complex it is. Um, also leaves no other option than, um, than AI solutions. Um, even the, the, the scientists what, uh, with all the intelligence and all their knowledge cannot connect all their findings and all the data that they are generating. So with, with banking it's uh, is not so dissimilar. I uh, had the privilege that um, I had to work, uh, could work with lots of entrepreneurs. Um, and what we as bankers do, we, we don't really create things, but we help people uh, to be to flourish. Uh, with their ideas, um, to put money behind, to put capital behind, and to analyze it, and also have help investors to uh, put um, the best resources for the best ideas. Uh, that's that's a, a privileged situation, and um, obviously you see a lot of systems around the world. As a, if you have a global role, and you see a lot of different technologies, and um, and that knowledge hopefully helps me uh, to discriminate between right and wrong, and uh, what is useful and what is uh, what is less useful. Um, there is a lot of um, not too useful technologies, but. Um, but there is a lot of big questions that we still have to solve um, where we need technology and we need, uh, we need also the industry to develop those innovative ideas. So, last topic for our interview. Um, I may ask uh, the both of you, uh, Mr. Herzog, Mr. Brunninger first, um, what can Austria do to improve uh, the, the state right now? Yeah. We have, we have two situations in Austria. First of all, for the relative small size of the country, we have a huge uh, pool of talent uh, in Austria, especially fintech, for example, which is also very related to, to, to healthcare. It's a lot about of data safety. Um, there is um, almost everybody who uses it, um, and there's a high complexity to it. Um, and um, after Berlin and after London, of course, we are the third most productive country uh, for, for fintech. Um, it would be great uh, to do this to achieve the same in healthcare. So the situation that we have uh, in, in, in Austria, which is a bit of a shame that um, we have a bit of a data anxiety, I would, I would call it, compared to other countries. But data anxiety is not always a bad thing uh, because um, you're more cautious, um, you maybe um, take um, a slower pace, uh, which is sometimes an advantage. But um, when I look into healthcare, I think um, we have to solve these questions quickly. Um, there will always be questions around privacy, but I think there is, um, we're already beyond that because there's so many um, ways to protect that privacy in a way that this is actually a, a beyond, beyond the question. I would almost say it the other way around, it's almost unethical not using data 
for the benefit of the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, not using this won't be the same, not using a stethoscope, not using an MRI machine because we don't want to look inside patients. Uh, what we cannot see with the free eye doesn't exist. No one would say this these days. I see it very similar with the data. Uh, data, you know, that's true. It's not uh, obviously something that a lot of people say, but it is still new oil and we have to do the right thing with that. Is that so what has to be done? <laughs> yes, in Austria we have to do this. Uh, I think we have, we have a lot of, of talents, I fully agree, and we have, we have a lot of good schools, good universities, top universities here, here, here in Austria. We have a very big, relatively big biotech tech sector in, in Austria compared to the, to the size. The question will, will be how to, how to dis distinguish between uh, which ideas and which business models can, can not only sustain commercially, but can also bring the utmost benefit to the, to the, to the patient and to, and to, to the people. So, so that, so that Austria again, as it has been long ago, again becomes a leader in the, in the health tech sec sector. This, this would be a, a, a a goal and it's very difficult but the, the utmost question we, have, we all have to ask every day should be what is the benefit to the patient what is the benefit to to the people and um, how can we manage to bring all the knowledge that is existing not only in austria but in the whole world um, to bring the latest technology in, uh, on ai um, as quickly as possible and as concrete as possible for the benefit of the people and, and, and the patient this is the big question there will be legal frameworks new legal frameworks and there will be also uh, has to be a change in the public public perception of the, of the people and we slowly but surely has to have to overcome in the Austrian society this, this, this data, an an data anxiety. This is the big question. So last but not least, as an EU expert, this time not as a startup founder, but as an EU expert, what view do you have on Austria? Um, from uh, the conversation, also the interaction I have, I think Austria has the uh, opportunity as a, a small country, but also um, uh, looking to the data restrictions, uh, similar to the large country here in Germany, has the opportunity to show example how you can combine the two together and to still implement a solution uh, that is using data. And I agree with you. Now, for me, what is unethical if we have the data and we are not using to early identify our patients earlier to identify what treatments is best for them. So I think uh, that you have that opportunity. Yes, there is, uh, there is barriers, but we have the GDPR. And it's already, uh, I mean, solving a lot of privacy issue. So <coughs> let's not complicate it. Let's just get started. And I think the way to start as we do it as a startup, with big companies, they are giant companies. Do do it. Uh, uh, let's not spend too much money. Let's start projects that will show results within one year, mm. and assess the feasibility. Is it helping or not? And in an agile approach, feasibility, we open it for usage in an MVP and a sandbox environment. And if it proves good results, we roll it out. If as member states, as hospitals, as life sciences, as insurance companies, we act. We have, you know, learn a little bit from startups how we do it, you know, do it in this quick, fast way and try to show without spending too much. I think we can really make it happen in Europe. So, thank okay. you. That was a great final remark. <laughs> thank you very much for the interview. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And we see each other later. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.